Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. I'm a divorce and litigation civil attorney here in Northern California. Right From time to time, I like to comment on criminal cases in the news, although that's not my forte. Okay, well, let's talk about a criminal case that, in my opinion, deserves your attention. Right? We fall in love with narratives. We fall in love with very sympathetic, attractive people who happen to be witnesses or victims of terrible crimes. And we want justice as a society. Right? We want to hold the wrongdoer responsible for their actions. This case, in my opinion, leads to some big mistakes that I think we need to look at carefully as we look at ourselves in the mirror and as we analyze other cases in the news. So let's get after it. An attractive woman, her name is Rochelle Shatina. In her 50s, right, 50-ish, is dating a successful plastic surgeon named Thomas Dixon in Texas. Now it's passionate, but something is just not quite right. Right? So, he later tells the cops, when they come to interview him, that he loves, loves, loves this woman, but that it didn't work out. Now, we're all adults. I, myself, am in my 50s. And this is grown folk stuff, right? The breakup could have happened for any of a million reasons. Right? What we know is that the breakup happened. So the woman moves on. She is in dance class. She meets a great dancer who happens to be divorced. Late 40s. Grown kids who are now out of the house. This great dancer is also a doctor who is financially comfortable. They hit it off. They start dating. She meets his kids who are very protective of dad. The kids like her. Dad loves her. Now let's pivot right here. This pivot is necessary, in my opinion, to give a three-dimensional picture of the situation. There are some facts that have come out that we, the public, know now that some of the people involved at the time in this series of relationships were unaware of. Unbeknownst to Dad, and his name was Dr. Joseph Sonier. His new girlfriend kept in touch with her old plastic surgeon former boyfriend. They texted each other and discussed going away on a weekend trip. The plastic surgeon didn't know that she had met someone new. At the last minute, she tells him she's not going on the weekend trip with him because she is in a new relationship with a man she met dancing. So, here is what we know now for certain. Right? For certain. The plastic surgeon's drinking and smoking cigar buddy, David Shepard, starts investigating the new boyfriend at the plastic surgeon's request. Right? The plastic surgeon 
wants to find out about this boyfriend. In fact, the goal is to find some embarrassing information about this boyfriend. They're hoping the boyfriend is a philanderer. They want to have information that the plastic surgeon can then present to the ex-girlfriend that he loves, right, to win her back. The end game, if you believe the defense, and understand, in murder cases, there are different points of view. The end game here is to get some information about possibly some other women this new boyfriend might be seeing that they could then present to the ex-girlfriend to say, look, your new guy is a bad guy. Come back home to me. Right? So, let's use common sense here also. I'm guessing some of the people watching this video have drinking or smoking buddies. How much would you have to pay your drinking or smoking buddy to get them to spy on your ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend? Right? You can have a drinking buddy. He or she can really enjoy your friendship. And when you start saying things like, hey, can you take your free time and spy for me on my ex's new boo, right? A lot of drinking buddies are going to say, you got to be kidding, man. <laughs> you know? I have my own life. I have my own bills to pay. I don't have time to be creeping around, hopping out of bushes, hoping to find this guy in some compromising situation. So, I believe a lot of people understand that they need to make a project like this worthwhile for their drinking and smoking buddy. So here, and it's important, the buddy receives three silver bars. Right, The total value of the three is about $9,000. He also receives some cigars. After all, he's a smoking buddy. Right? Now, this issue is the major issue in the case. I know it sounds innocent enough. Giving a smoking buddy some cigars and some silver bars. But the big question in the case, it's really the only question in the case is what exactly was the drinking and smoking buddy hired to do? The prosecution is arguing that the drinking buddy is actually hired to murder the new boyfriend. The defense wants you to believe that the drinking buddy is hired to spy on the new boyfriend. So, understand, if the defense is right, and it's not their burden, right, the prosecution has to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that the drinking buddy has been hired to murder the new boyfriend. Right? If the defense is right, and this drinking buddy was really hired to be a voyeur, right? you hire a drinking buddy, he has a camera, maybe he's able to snap some photos, maybe he's able to find this guy in a compromising situation with someone else, right? Because let's face it, the plastic surgeon just heard of the new boyfriend knows next to nothing about him. Right now, all I can say is, if this is just a please spy on the new boyfriend type of deal, there's no crime. 
right? People in the United States hire private eyes every day. If instead the drinking buddy, and keep in mind this drinking buddy is not out of San Quentin. He hasn't just gotten out of jail for, you know, some violent crime. Right? If your longtime drinking buddy wants to be a murderer and you decide, you know what, Joe, why don't you start your craft here? Right? If the drinking buddy's hired to murder the new boyfriend, then obviously it's capital murder. So, the drinking buddy goes to the new boyfriend's house and shoots him to death using a bottle of Gatorade as a silencer. Now I believe this next point is very important. There is simply no evidence, none whatsoever, that the plastic surgeon and the drinking buddy ever discussed using a bottle of Gatorade as a silencer. In fact, the drinking buddy would later tell police that he got the idea from watching a movie. In other words, at a minimum, we know that some of the ideas here involving the murder were the drinking buddies idea. Right? Let's continue. After the murder, the drinking buddy becomes suicidal. He's racked with guilt. Right? Racked with guilt. After all, this guy isn't a career criminal. This guy has never killed anyone before, at least that we know of. So, the drinking buddy starts talking about how he was involved in this crime with a third party. He then, of course, starts talking to the cops after this third party goes to the cops and starts talking about the conversations. The drinking buddy then tells the cops that the plastic surgeon hired him to do the murder. Right? And in exchange for a deal to take the death penalty off the table, the drinking buddy lays out the entire scheme. Well, let me just say this. Once the death penalty is off the table and the drinking buddy pleads guilty to capital murder, the prosecution then presents him as their star witness at the murder trial of the plastic surgeon. Now again, the key issue, in my opinion, it's the only issue is what exactly was this drinking buddy hired to do? The state has to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. Now if I'm a juror, I want to hear from the drinking buddy myself. I don't want to hear a lot of hearsay from people the drinking buddy talked to. Right? After all, the state has given the drinking buddy a deal, haven't they? I want to hear what the drinking buddy has to say in court. I don't want to hear from police officers or law enforcement people or people from the district attorney's office on what the drinking buddy supposedly told them outside of court. You know, I almost view the law like I do American Idol. In other words, the rehearsals don't matter. 
What matters is what the performer is able to do at the performance. You have to hit the right notes. You have to sing the song in a way that gets you recognition. Here, what's paramount more than anything else is what the drinking buddy tells the jury. Because the defense is claiming, look, our guy did hire him to spy on the new boyfriend. Why would we hire this non-criminal to kill the new boyfriend? Well, let me just say that the prosecution presents to the jury some texts that the plastic surgeon sent to his drinking buddy, right, while the drinking buddy is out investigating the new boyfriend. Right? The text includes some phrases like whip and spur and get her done. Now keep in mind, the defendant doesn't contest that he hired this drinking buddy to spy on the new boyfriend. These phrases sound like the type of things, in my opinion, that a parent would tell their child before the child takes an important exam. Right? These are just words of encouragement. They don't sound like instructions on how to murder an individual. Right? Keep in mind, too, this is Texas. Someone says to you, whip and spur. Well, <laughs> some of these phrases are phrases in the Texas lexicon, right? Get her done. They aren't unique to the case. I don't think a jury can rely on them to constitute explicit instructions to murder the victim. I believe the prosecution's reference to these phrases shows the weakness in their case. So again, rather than rely on text messages like this, if I'm a juror, I would want to hear from the drinking buddy, the guy who did the murder, the guy who got the deal from the prosecution. Right? So the drinking buddy takes a stand at the first trial. There he is in front of the jury. And he tells the jury under oath that he did the killing on his own. That the murder was his idea. Well folks, that's the end of the case for me. If I'm a juror I don't have anything else to think about. The state has the burden. When the drinking buddy takes the stand, that's the time for him to tell us, the jury, what happened. I'm really not that interested in what he told members of the prosecution earlier. Right? For all I know, that was to get them to take the death penalty off the table, which they did. Right, This guy, who we know is guilty, I'm talking about the drinking buddy, had his own motivation to tell the prosecution whatever story was needed to avoid being sentenced to death. Right, so I'm a juror. The plastic surgeon is on trial. This is the plastic surgeon's trial now. 
The prosecution has presented their witness, who they've given a deal to. If this guy can't serve the role, if he doesn't back up the prosecution's theory of the case from the stand, then there is no way I'm not going to have reasonable doubts about the prosecution's theory of the case. Their key witness has to be the linchpin of their presentation. This is a matter of trust, of credibility. If I've sat there through an opening statement and I've heard some theory of the case where this drinking buddy was hired by the defendant who was not at the scene of the crime, his link to the crime is supposed to be this drinking buddy. Right? If I'm there as a juror and I'm thinking, okay, well, what instructions did this guy receive from the defendant? And if the guy then directly tells me under oath that the murder was his idea, well, there's no coming back from that for me. Right? If I were in the jury box, I'd start thinking about other things. I would tell other jurors, hey, I'm pretty dead set in my opinion. The prosecution, knowing they had a burden, right, knowing the burden of proof is with them, chose to put on an unreliable, inconsistent witness as their main witness. So, let me just tell you, I watched the 2020 episode, and you have a lot of, you know, vibrant people on that show, right? The people, you know, include not just the folks at ABC hired to put on the show, but the vibrancy extends to the you know, girlfriend who you can imagine is devastated. Right? She just had her new boyfriend killed. And she's upset, of course, with the plastic surgeon former boyfriend who she left. She's devastated. You can imagine. The victim's children are completely devastated. Dad met a new woman. They liked her. Dad was having fun. Dad then gets killed. They want justice. Right? This drinking buddy who didn't really have a connection to Dad's new girlfriend. Right? Why would he just randomly shoot their father without being goaded into doing so? I understand the concern, but here we need to pivot and we need to do this in every case. The prosecution has the burden of proof, not the defendant. They have to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt. When they fail, and here I believe they failed miserably, when they fail to satisfy that burden, the defendant should walk. I don't care how vibrant anybody looks. I don't care what the star witness told the prosecution before trial. At trial, the star witness has to tell that to the jury. If the star witness contradicts the prosecution's theory of the case, then it should be game over. I don't need to hear any character assassination of any defendant in a courtroom. I don't need to hear that the defendant's narcissistic or the defendant was a puppeteer, a manipulator. Right? That, to me really doesn't matter. 
when the prosecution's star witness doesn't support the prosecution's theory of the case. In fact, directly contradicts it. Understand, if you're a juror and you believe what the star witness is telling you directly on the day of trial, then the defendant is innocent. Period. Point blank. If this drinking buddy, for whatever reason, and let's be clear here, the drinking buddy is suicidal afterwards. Right? The drinking buddy may have been mentally stressed. Might have had other things going on in his life. Right? Days have 24 hours. This guy might have had a life separate and distinct from this murder that may have led him to suddenly pursue some Gatorade bottle as a silencer fantasy that he had. Given the seriousness of the charges, capital murder, right? how could this case even proceed after the star witness tells the jury that it was all his idea? Well, let me tell you what happened. So the first trial ends in a mistrial, right? A couple of jurors, you know, heard this guy and then said, gee, why are we here? This is ridiculous. This guy's unreliable. This guy's statements contradict the prosecution's opening statements. Understand, the prosecution, after the guy said it was all his idea, the prosecution then impeached their own witness. They then started showing his earlier statements, his earlier interview with them, interviews with them, where he discusses how, you know, uh, he was hired to do this murder and he, you know, talks about his conversation, allegedly, with the plastic surgeon. Right? Well, my point to you is if the guy's a liar, How could I reach a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt based on his testimony? If the guy is telling two diametrically opposed versions of the same story, right? How could I rely on him to send a man to prison for life without parole? So, of course, the second trial takes place. And would you believe they convicted the plastic surgeon of capital murder? Sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole? Can you believe that? Now fortunately, that verdict's been thrown out. He's going to be tried again. Folks, I'm just putting this as simply as possible. In my opinion, the prosecution doesn't have a case. If the people involved, right, the girlfriend who dated the plastic surgeon, moved on, then had her new boyfriend murdered, if she wasn't attractive, if the victim wasn't an attractive doctor restarting his life after a divorce, if the plastic surgeon wasn't viewed as unsympathetic, because let's face it, even his own lawyers have to feel a little uneasy about him hiring a friend to spy on his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend. Right? Understand, if none of that existed, this case would never be tried. If I'm a juror, and I hear that under oath in court, the prosecution's star witness gave different testimony than the testimony he told the prosecution when he was getting the death penalty taken off the table. There is no way I would have any comfort level in finding beyond a reasonable doubt that the plastic surgeon hired this drinking buddy to commit murder. 
Let me also say, too, that when the prosecution goes to text messages, and they say, look, we have some text messages that support our theory, right? Those text messages better say things like, shoot her in the head, or shoot him in the head, right? Empty the gun. Use hollow point bullets. Right? If, if the text messages are vague and ambiguous and are just, you know, whip and spur or whatever, you know, uh, garden variety words of encouragement, and the prosecution expects me to interpret those vague and ambiguous text messages as evidence to convict a man of capital murder, then the prosecution is kidding themselves. So I invite everyone to watch the current episode of 2020. I invite everyone to go to the ABC News website right now and read up about this case. You're going to notice they interview a lot of people. You're going to notice there is a lot of emotion. But missing from all of this is the testimony the star witness gave in trial, under oath. If you believe that testimony, and why wouldn't you? It's the prosecution's own witness. If you believe that testimony, then the verdict has to be not guilty. Right? Understand. Not guilty really means not proven. This case, in my opinion, should never have been brought. Let's hope the state of Texas has enough common sense, even though everyone looks photogenic, right? Even though, you know, some of the people involved have great careers, even though the victim's kids look supportive of dad and want justice, let's hope the state of Texas has the common sense not to try this case again. When the actual murderer says, this was all my idea, folks, that closes the door, in my opinion, to a successful prosecution. Let me also say, too, when the murderer tells you, yeah, you know, I used a Gatorade bottle. And then the prosecution figures out that this was from a Steven Seagal movie. And you realize that this murderer, who then is suicidal, did things his way, wasn't following any kind of detailed script, right? Then that by itself should have jurors thinking, well, gee, doesn't that support his testimony in court that this was his idea? So, uh, it's a travesty in my opinion. I'm deeply bothered that the defendant got convicted. Again, you know, the issue isn't whether or not you have a gut feeling that someone was involved in the crime. The question is whether or not the prosecution has proven that beyond a reasonable doubt. Here, they not only didn't do that, but the best piece of exculpatory evidence came from the witness that they had to deal with. That's how I see it. Don't fall in love with criminal prosecution narratives, folks, right? I know the prosecution has a great story involving a, you know, ex-boyfriend who wants to get back at his ex-girlfriend. You know, great. They didn't prove it here. Not guilty in my eyes. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.